Então, eu vou passar aqui para a segunda parte da reunião. Bom dia a todos e vamos lá. Uh, hoje a reunião será em inglês, uh, devido à presença do professor Meta, e é uma grande honra contar com ele aqui. Então, antes de mais nada, vamos trocar aí para o English. Uh, well, uh, good morning for everyone who listens uh, in Brazil, and good evening for Professor Meta in Singapore. It's really, really a great honor to have you here with us, uh, Professor, and we are very uh, uh, glad that you could uh, accept this invitation. And I also thank uh, Dr. Francisco Bandeira, who uh, also accepted uh, being here with us today, and he will coordinate uh, the question and answers uh, afterwards. Well, uh, I will call now uh, Dr. Gabriel Murad for presenting the first topic of this meeting. Uh, this meeting will be about uh, fake IOLs and will further explore afterwards the limits of uh, refractive surgery and some other topics, in, uh, mainly in research lines from Professor Meta's uh, group. And first of all, uh, Gabriel uh, will discuss a published paper and please, uh, Gabriel, go ahead. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Gabriel Murad, and uh, I am a fellow here in the Surgical Optics Division in the School of Pediatric Medicine's Department of Ophthalmology, and I'll be presenting the research paper discussion in today's meeting. Uh, so the research paper that I brought uh, was published in the American Journal of Ophthalmology in October 2019, and it's titled uh, Posterior Chamber Fake Intraocular Lens Implantation for the Correction of Myopia and Myopic Astigmatism a retrospective 10-year follow-up study. Uh, the authors are listed uh, here, and uh, they had no financial support or financial conflict of interest uh, with this study. So before we talk about the, the study itself, just a little bit of a background. Um, we have uh, the ICLs, uh, implantable columnar lenses, which are a type of posterior chamber fake IOLs. Uh, that have a material, a composition uh, that leads to stability in the eye in, in the long term, meaning that they won't have their uh, molecular structure changed uh, be, for being inside the eye. However, even, even though there is this related stability, there are a few uh, complications that are described uh, uh, regarding this, this IOL implantation, such as risk of angle closure, uh, cataracts, corneal decompensation, and uveitis, uh, just to name a few. And uh, this surgery is mainly performed uh, just as the anterior chamber IOLs as well, usually in patients uh, who cannot undergo uh, corneal refractive surgery, for example, uh, or they have uh, such a high uh, uh, diopter in the refraction that the corneal refractive surgery could not um, lead to the de desired refraction. So they usually are young. That's what I mean with this. So. Being young patients, mostly, uh, we have to know about the long-term safety and stability since these, these patients will have these lenses inside their eyes for a long time, most likely. So what, this, uh, what our authors are asking with this study is if the ICL implantation is a safe procedure in the long term. <clears throat> the long term meaning here, uh, 10 years, which is the, the time that the, patient, the, the authors are going to study our patients. So for the methods, uh, it is a retrospective analysis of the post-operative examinations up to 10 years after the ICL implantation of 114 eyes <clears throat> of 61 patients between 2005 and 2007 at the Nagoya Eye Clinic. And uh, the surgeries performed in this time period in this clinic uh, had these inclusion criteria. I'm gonna list them because it's also a good exercise for us to remember what we have to look for in the patients that we are planning to perform the, the uh, posterior fake uh, IOL uh, surgery. So, of course, unsatisfactory correction with spectacles or contact lenses, an age between 20 and 50 years old, stable refraction. Uh, the refractions that uh, the patients had uh, before the surgery here in this study was uh, minus 0 0.5 to minus 18. Uh, their anterior chamber depth greater than 2.7, an endothelial cell density higher than 1,800 cells per millimeter square, no history of other ocular conditions, so they excluded patients with keratoconus, uh, glaucoma, cataracts, uh, uveitis, uh, scleritis, and a uh, few other uh, ocular conditions, and no systemic diseases that could affect wound healing. The author uh, gives the example of diabetes or uh, severe atopia as examples of such systemic diseases. 
And what the authors looked for in the follow-up, this 10-year follow-up, was the uncorrected distance visual acuity. The corrected distance visual acuity, so the, the corrected uh, visual acuity would show us if there was any uh, diopter of refraction left after the surgery. The manifest refraction, of course, the scanning slit, the intraocular pressure, endothelial cell density, and these two indexes, the safety index and the efficacy index, uh, meaning that the safety would be the post-operative corrected distance visual acuity over the pre-operative corrected distance visual acuity. Basically, uh, it is we can we can translate this to better understand what this index means. It will be the best visual acuity of the patient uh, after the surgery and before the surgery to see if it was if there was any loss or any gain in the best possible uh, uh, visual acuity of the patient. And the efficacy index, on the other hand. Uh, uh, analyzes the uncorrected visual acuity in the post-operative over the pre-operative corrected visual acuity. So for us to see if there was a refraction, uh, refractive success after the in implant of the ICL. And of course, if there were any complications. Uh, these variables were uh, analyzed in the one day post-operative, uh, one week, one month, six months, and then one, three, five, eight, and 10 years uh, visits of the patients in, in, this, in this clinic. Uh, the ICL was selected by the STAR Surgical using the anterior chamber depth and the white-to-white -white measured with orb scan. The models of the ICL used in the study were all uh, ICL before and toric ICL before. And the vault between the anterior surface of the crystalline lens, so here I just put this image for, uh, for the members of the audience who are not very familiar with this procedure, so the, the, the phakic lens is placed uh, anteriorly to the, to the crystalline lens. And uh, the vault between the anterior surface of the, of the crystalline lens and the posterior face of the ICL was assessed initially with a slip lamp, but then from 2010 and beyond uh, with the anterior segment OCT. The surgeries were performed, just to remember, uh, from 2005, 2007, but the follow-up was 10 years. So we are looking at patients that went to the, to the clinic up until 2017. Uh, Two weeks prior to the surgery, two peripheral laser iridotomies were performed at 10.30 and 1.30 clock hour positions. Uh, acetazolamide uh, to 250 milligrams was given postoperatively. And uh, for one week after the surgery, uh, the patients were given steroidal and antibiotic eye drops, who were, uh, which were steadily reduced uh, with the follow-up. For the results of this study, uh, of the 114 eyes, uh, 72 of the lenses were toric ICLs and 42 were spherical ICLs. We have here the demographs of the, of the population. There, this is a lot of numbers, of course, but basically what I'm going to uh, call the attention of, uh, here is that the mean age was 36 uh, for both the toric and the spherical uh, groups. And there was no, uh, there were not a lot of differences between these two groups, as we would expect. However, of course, a big difference is the cylinder which uh, of course it is expected, but the, the mean uh, cylinder in the toric group was minus 1.72, and the mean uh, cylinder in the spherical group was minus 0 0.23. And this was uh, statistically significant, again, as we would expect uh, in this surgical planning. The number of eyes examined at each visit, uh, at the six month visit, uh, a visit, 93% of the, of the eyes of patients uh, uh, were present at the visit. Uh, at one year, 82.5%. At three years, it dropped uh, to around 50%. And uh, at eight years, it came back to 78. And then in the 10 years, which is the main objective of the study, 61% of the, of the patients uh, were present at the visit. So here, uh, the first graph that we're gonna analyze of this study uh, compares the corrected distance visual acuity after and before the, the surgery. So basically this would translate to the safety index that we mentioned before. Uh, so I'm just gonna move, yeah. So uh, each one of these columns represents a, a marking time of the post-operative. So uh, the blue one is six months and then the yellow one is 10 years and all the other columns are in between. We see that most, most of the, the highest columns uh, are in the, in the no change group, meaning that the corrected distance visual acuity before and after the surgery was the same. So there would be no uh, drop or gain in the po best possible visual acuity uh, before and after the surgery. Sorry. Um, 
however, there were a few groups, a few groups that uh, lost one or more or two or more lines here, and some of them even gained one one line. However, the gained two or more lines here were um, uh, were not no there was no patients present here in the ten year follow up. So just to translate what we just saw in the graph to uh, text to organize it a little bit better, uh, 38 eyes had no change in the corrected visual acuity, 26 eyes had lost one line, and five eyes had lost two or more lines, and one eye had gained one line in the 10 years follow-up. The mean safety index was 0 0.88 uh, at 10 years of follow-up. This graph, on the other hand, uh, compares the uncorrected visual acuity in the post-operative and the corrected visual acuity before the surgery. So. The, the grayish column here is the preoperative corrected distance visual acuity. As we would expect, most of our patients had 2020 at least, uh, with a few of them having 2016 and 2010. Uh, and in the six months follow up, which is the, the next line here, the blue one, uh, basically was almost all the patients had at least 2020 as well. However, you can see that this dropped a little bit with, uh, with time. So with the passing of time, we see that not all patients maintained uh, non corrected distance visual acuity uh, with the follow up. Uh, the author is going to discuss this. We're going to discuss this a little bit uh, in the later graphs, but uh, this may be due to a myopic regression in, in some of the patients. However, uh, the author considers that the efficacy here was still a good one because the, most patients had a visual acuity of at least 2040 or better, even. 10 years after the, the procedure. And the uncorrected visual acuity log mar was uh, a mean of zero, minus 0 0.01, which translating to a Snellen uh, comparison would be close to 2020. Um, and the mean efficacy index, sorry, let me just, yeah, it was 0 0.66 at the 10 year follow up. The predictability of the surgery, uh, these are the numbers that had a spherical equivalent within 0.5 from the attempted one. So we can see that in the six months follow-up, 93% of the patients had a planned uh, spherical equivalent, very similar to the one that they achieved. However, uh, with the passing of time, it is also tended to change. And if we uh, change this, this analysis to one diopter difference from the attempted spherical equivalent, we see that over 85% of the patients, even 10 years after the surgery, had uh, an attempted spherical equivalent within one diopter from the attempted one. And for this study, all of the patients had uh, an attempted um, uh, spherical equivalent of uh, plano for the follow-up. Here in the, this graph shows what we just discussed. So uh, almost all of the patients here, the biggest columns, of course, are from the 0.5 minus 0 0.5 to zero uh, equivalent refraction, spherical equivalent refraction. And we can see that there were uh, some variations, of course, uh, for the 10 year follow-up. Uh, most of them are, are here in this area, meaning that is a variation of one diopter only. Um, this graph shows the refractive astigmatism. I opened something here. Yeah, the refractive astigmatism, we can see that the, for the patients, of course, who had uh, the toric ICL, 57% uh, of the patients had an astigmatism of uh, uh, smaller than 0 0.5 in 10 years of follow-up, which are these two groups here. Uh, and then we can see that basically no patients had uh, an, a refractive astigmatism of higher than one after 10 years of uh, follow-up. Regarding the stability, uh, the manifest spherical equivalent nearly reached emetropia on day one. Uh, so it went from minus 9.97 before the surgery to 0 0.13 in the day one, and zero, minus 0 0.43 in the 10th year. Uh, so since the author uh, saw that there was this uh, myopic shift, this light myopic shift with the 10 years follow-up, he divided the patients in two groups, the ones that had a myopic shift uh, in this time frame, and the ones that did not. And this group, uh, this graph, uh, shows us the behavior of the, the mean spherical equivalent of these two groups. The continuous line is the patient, are the patients that did have the uh, myopic shift, and they went from a mean uh, spherical equivalent over time that uh, became more and more negative up, up to a mean of minus two in 10 years. And the ones that did not have this regret, this myopic regression, uh, stayed close to plano even after 10 years. 
He defined this map regression as a change in one diopter or more. Uh, 12 eyes had this behavior in eight years. Uh, he used eight, eight instead of 10 here in this measure because the same eyes had the, this in, in, the, in the 10 year uh, mark. And no statistical difference between this group and the non myopic group uh, regarding pre-surgery spherical uh, equivalent or, uh, or age. There was, however, a difference between the spherical equivalent in one month and six months of the myopic regression group, meaning that maybe this, this difference could have been detected early uh, already with six months of follow-up. The IOP had no significant increase in any cases. And the endothelial cell loss uh, was a mean in 10 years of 5.3%, uh, with a statistical difference between the preoperative and the 10 year follow up. Uh, preoperative, the mean was 2,739, uh, 2, and after the 10 years was 2,581. 2, Regarding complications, there were 20, 12 eyes that had anterior subcapsular cataract of which only four were symptomatic and had to undergo ICL explantation and FACO emulsification. The difference uh, in this, uh, was present in the pre-surgery spherical equivalent. Uh, this was uh, the patients who had the anterior subcapsular cataracts had a, a spherical equivalent of minus 12, and the ones that did not had a, a, of minus 9.7. And this was statistically significant between the two groups. This was the only uh, variable that was different between these two groups. There was no statistical difference in age of the patients. And one patient had nuclear cataracts. However, it was asymptomatic and it was only eight or eight to 10 years after the surgery. So for the conclusions of this study, um, is the ICL implantation a safe procedure in the long term? According to the data that the author provides, yes, it seems to be. However, I bring some topics to discussion. Uh, mainly, uh, the author focuses a lot on the uh, visual acuity and does not uh, mention a lot about the patient satisfaction uh, with the result of the surgery. Maybe some of those patients who had lost uh, one line or even there was 2040, uh, we, we don't know if they were happy with the uh, surgery or not. Maybe they were, or maybe even they stayed 2020 and don't know the quality of the vision. Uh, regarding the myopic regression, the author did not uh, measure the actual length, which, which would be maybe interesting for us to understand better what was happening to these patients that had uh, the myopic shift with the follow-up. And uh, this is not a critic to the study by any means, but just something that I wanted to know from the, the audience members who have more experience with this type of surgery, that uh, there are many uh, very frequently mentioned complications of the uh, structure chamber IOL um, implantations that were not present in the results here. He, he only had cases of cataracts, um, and we didn't see uh, cases that had a clinical, clinically significant endothelial cell uh, density loss or um, IOP increases. So this is, I think this is a, a nice start to the conversation of this, of this surgery. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Gabriel. Well, uh, first of all, I'll say some words about our uh, other guests today. And as I've already mentioned, it's a, a really great honor to have Professor Meta here with us. Uh, Professor Meta has uh, done his uh, basic and advanced training in ophthalmology in the UK. And he is currently the head of the corneal external disease uh, department in the Singapore National Eye Center and also occupies many other uh, leadership positions and the Singapore uh, Eye Research Institute, for uh, example. And he leads a many uh, research lines with very impactful uh, studies with almost 400 uh, publications under his name. And really, really a, a great and extensive uh, curriculum. And it's really uh, very, very nice to have you here with us today, Professor. And also Dr. Uh, Francisco Bandera, who has done his <clears throat> training in the in Rio de Janeiro. And afterwards, he, uh, he, did, he did his specialization in cornea external disease here uh, at UNIFEST. And being a research fellow in Barcelona under Professor Gal, um, assistance and also 
uh, in Singapore with uh, Professor Mehta and currently is doing his doctorate here in uh, UNIFESC. So uh, I'd like to ask uh, Dr. Mehta if he would like to comment on the article presented by uh, Gabriel, but I believe uh, Dr. Francisco wants to say some words uh, before you start, Professor. Well, uh, good morning. Uh, it's great to see everyone around, even after this uh, terrible pandemic. Um, we miss meeting everyone in, in meetings around the world. And uh, I don't know, you pretty much covered everything I could say about Jod, but uh, recently, but, um, regarding this subject, myopia and, and surgery, uh, Singapore Eye Research Institute uh, was granted more than I think one million or much more uh, uh, with, uh, not one million, I think it's more, with uh, one eye, uh, eye research on myopia by Johnson & Johnson. And they are currently working on prevention, uh, the ex light exposure uh, in animals. It's a large study. I think it's much more than a million. Correct me if I'm wrong, Professor. I think I'm being too humble, right? 30 million. Yeah, 30 million. Yeah. So <laughs> I, I knew it was a bit off, but not that off. Uh, so there are uh, more than 11 research lines that you're working on now. And it's hard to keep up with Jod, so uh, he he always has a lot to uh, a lot to say about uh, subjects among refractive uh, cataract laser surgery, and uh, try to keep up with his lecture. A lot of information I expect, uh, and uh, we'll do a, a bit of a, a chat after afterwards. Um, nice to have you here, Jod. Thank you, thank you, Francesco. Thank you for the. Uh, kind invitation uh, to be in Brazil virtually anyway, if not if uh, physically for the for the time being. But um, uh, thank you for uh, for the presentation. It was a, a interesting study. I mean, I think that these kind of studies are important because there are very few studies that actually have long term data, which is something that we all want to basically see. And and it's something that I stress to a lot of patients when they're having refractive surgery. I mean, you made the point a little bit on your study description about the age initially, which is actually, I think, a little bit high, um, 36. Uh, so I would consider that to be a little bit high compared to our natural uh, cohort. I'm not sure in Brazil, but certainly in Singapore, the average age of your refractive patients is actually about 29. And I can tell you the difference when I was in the UK, I used to think high myopia was over minus six. And in Singapore, the mean myopia is minus six. And they don't consider anything high myopia unless you're talking about 12. I've seen people up in here minus 23, which are numbers I just were like, I've never even seen in my life before and stuff. So routinely in the refractive clinics, we're seeing people in the range of six to 10. And um, it's important to have every available, basically just uh, tool um, that you know of, whether it's basically ICL or whether it's SMILE or LASIK or whatever you're basically doing at your disposal to be able to treat these people, because these are the people who are basically walking in the door. And if you want to you know, pretty reasonable, successful refractive practice, you've got to basically be apt at basically managing all these uh, kind of things. But I, li I like the paper because it has long term follow up, which I think is important. Um, I, I, mean, I make your point, your point about the obviously with the details missing on some of the long term complications. But I think that, you know, generally these kind of papers are very, very useful as opposed to one year, two year studies from which there are a lot in the literature as well. Thank you very much. Okay, so um, should I start, Francesco? So, yeah, I uh, think but, we're pretty good to go. Uh, does anyone has any other comments uh, about the study? Um, I think uh, Professor Wallace commented on the complications, but uh, Gabriel did a pretty good job. So maybe we can move forward. Okay, uh, you can see the screen, it's all right? Yep. Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. All right. So again, I'd like to thank for the kind invitation uh, to... Um, uh, be at this um, uh, teaching seminar. So I'm going to be talking, I'm just going to ask me to talk about um, fake guy wells. These are my uh, financial disclosures. They don't really pertain uh, to what we're going to basically be talking about it uh, today. So most of you will be familiar with the evolution of refractive surgery going from surface ablation techniques to LASIK, LASIK, and of course we have um, in lenticular surgery now, which is becoming very, very popular as well. And despite the you know improvements in all these laser, laser techniques, as refractive surgeons, we're still faced with the limitations of corneal thickness and curvature. 
limitations of corneal wound healing, uh, which can basically affect the safety of our refractive procedures. Patients with higher refractive errors, that, and certainly um, if you do a refractive laser procedure on them, they may require smaller optical zones. And obviously patients with thin corneas, um, they may be excluded from having laser refractive surgery, especially those with large mesopic uh, pupils. So we still face with these patients coming in the door as well. Um, Hyperopes are, I think, a quite a challenging group as well. I mean, we don't have so many in Singapore, but I think we know that excitement laser-based treatments are less accurate in this group as well. So I think that these are all the sort of challenging patients that we'll see. Of course, uh, you have a couple of choices. Some people do refractive lens exchange. I mean, certainly in younger age group, it's certainly more, com uh, more controversial. Um, people use it for correcting monitor to severe high, uh, myopia and also basically hyperopia really in the presbyopic age, uh, age range. And we need to, we'll talk a little bit about that later, but you have to bear in the risks of doing um, a refractive lens exchange in a younger person itself. There is a much, much higher risk of getting retinal attachments. Of course, these are myopes, so the risks are slightly higher anyway itself, but there's a significant risk in those patients less than uh, 50 years uh, old and those with large axial lens as well. Sorry. Um, so obviously they use loss of uh, accommodation when you have refractive lens exchange and of course effectively you have loss of functions and that's the appeal of basically doing fake ink drop lenses alone or in a standard loan with basically bioptics itself. So fake ink drop lenses are the best approach I think in young patients with moderate to higher degrees of refractive error. Obviously it's uh, contraindicated basically when patients are contraindicated from having a corneal refractive or excitement laser based procedure as well. And the main advantage is, is that they maintain accommodation and they're obviously conceptually reversible. And this is the whole basis of thinking about doing fake hours. And we'll talk a little bit about inclusion, exclusion criteria later and some of the controversies that go along with it. There are really three types of lenses and many of these, I put this really more for historical because it's more of a, from a teaching perspective as opposed to something that are actually in the market. But certainly I've gone through the evolution of my uh, career going through some of these lenses. You can divide them into three types, angle supported, iris claw, anterior chambers. These are both anterior chamber lenses and then basically obviously the most common, which is the posterior chamber lenses. If you look at the angle supported lenses, there were two, uh, the Cachet and the Kelman Dur. The Cachet was subsequently withdrawn. It was marketed by Alcon and it was subsequently withdrawn uh, from the market due to patients getting excessive um, endothelial cell loss. And there were also issues uh, with the cache with the lens rotating inside the anterior chamber. It was only a spherical uh, lens um, that was basically put inside the eye. Uh, the iris core lenses are mainly made the artisan and then the artifacts, which is the foldable uh, lens. And the posterior chamber lenses, of course, are most popular. Um, ICL made by basically Star. PRL was made by a uh, Russian company. And there's very little data now basically available in the literature from that. ICL is made by Star, as I mentioned, from Switzerland. It's a columnar lens. And there have been several lens types over the years. Uh, currently, the current version is V5C uh, lens. Um, I was using the V4 when I was a fellow, so basically back in 2006, 2007. And really from the V4A, uh, V4B, and then to V5C, there's been a change in the optical zone and some of the parameters on the lens, which I will basically show you. The diameter of the lens is about 11.5 to 13 millimeters. And of course, this is a sulcus position lens. This is the star columnar lens on the left-hand side. And the new things that you will see on the V5C is the century flow in the middle of the lens to help with basically aqueous production. Those lenses with toric have a toric basically marker on the surface over here. And also so you'll see holes in the other parts of the lens in the haptic basically positions as well. These other two lenses on the left-hand side are two lenses made by two different Indian companies. One was Apasami on the right-hand side. And these are hydrophilic acrylic lenses. And what you'll see is, is that actually they, they actually bear very many similarities to the star uh, lens. So you have a slightly smaller optical zone in the um, uh, eye acryl lens from about 4.6 to 5.5. So it's slightly smaller than the star lens. And you can see it has a centri flow and also holes on either side of the optic and also basically in the haptic plates. The Apasami lens also made of acrylic, but you see there's no central basically uh, flow. The optical zone diameter is about 5.75, so slightly bigger than the eye acryl lens. And also you've got the extra holes on the edge of the optical zone and also basically on the feet pedal. And now there are papers in the literature showing the results of these lenses in patients. So angle supported lenses, of course, came first. Uh, they were encouraging with their reports, but there were uh, significant complications in the long term. 
chronic endothelial cell loss or traction, PAS, and overalization in UGA syndrome. Newer lenses came on the market on the bottom over here. For those who haven't seen, this is a cache lens. Actually, this is from one of my patients. Um, I only actually put one in, actually, um, and uh, she still has actually re pretty reasonable endothelial cell count in this eye. And this is just a spherical lens inside the eye. But now all of these are basically withdrawn from the market, and these lenses are actually no longer available. Iris fixated lenses, again, the first generation models were quite old, 1953. Um, worst uh, lens came out in basically 1970s, 1980s, and this is a mid uh, peripheral iris lens itself. Um, in 19, sort of late 1980s, 1990s, um, they were basically put in sighted eyes and they basically achieve good um, outcomes. And we'll talk a little bit about complications of these lenses later, but they do are associated with chronic endothelial cell loss as well. This is just an example of basically a, one of the iris fixated lenses. You have to enclave the lens in this nugget of basically iris tissue. You can see on the pictures over here on the right hand side, and there's a special enclaving device to help you basically put this in. So Artisan is the main company that makes it. You can get a myopic, hyperopic, astigmatic uh, one, and also basically an apex. I, I, currently now, the only time I'll actually use this in basically is in apex uh, patients. Um, it also treats basically up to astigmatism. The main issue with the Artisan is the size of the incision to actually put the lens into your wound uh, construction is important. Um, you normally about five to six millimeters, and this could obviously induce surgical induced astigmatism. This, so this is one of the issues with the lenses. You do need to do a PI, so you can see that basically up top. The RT Flex is the foldable version. It does go through a basically same, a smaller incision, but it's the same enclavation uh, process to get the lens to basically stick on the iris. They have like a little uh, instrument that they give you at the same time to help you basically uh, get the nugget of the lens, but it can fall off if it's not basically done properly. Due to the problems that I'm, some of the problems I mentioned in the anterior chamber lenses, most people are basically prefer to go for a posterior chamber uh, solution. Uh, there is a lower incidence of glare and halos as basically the margins of people will cover the border of the optical zones. But you do get some shimmering effect, especially on the earlier V4, uh, V4B uh, lenses or V4 series lenses if, you use, if you've been using those as well. And it, the main advantage is there's lower risk of two endothelial cell count, of course, because they're lying in the posterior chamber. But there is a higher risk of basically cataract formation and pigment dispersion. We'll talk a little bit about that later. This is an example of a patient with a V4B in. So we used to do peripheral PIs at the top. So we used to do peripheral PIs at the top. You can see the lens implantation in the posterior chamber in front of the phagic lens. And this is what it looks like on basically on retroillumination. So preoperative evaluation of your patients is pretty much the same as most of the refractive surgery patients. Manifest like a refraction, corrective visual acuity, best corrective visual acuity, obviously pupillometry, GAT. You need to assess the angle uh, properly, and we'll talk a little bit on how you basically do that. Um, sit lamp, uh, endoscopy, obviously you need to do peripheral examination and retinal. A lot of these patients have moderate to very high degrees of myopia, so looking for any retinal degeneration. Um, AC depth measurements, you can take that basically from the orb scan and make sure it's the corneal depth measurements from the internal side or basically from uh, to pentacam and for tomography as well. Obviously, you can use OCT, so often I'll take at least two of these values to basically look at, to uh, make sure it's basically accurate. You must assess patients with dysfunctional lens syndrome, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute, um, especially if patients are in the pre presbyopic age group. So roughly, I would say anyone over the age of about 38, you must assess them for this itself. Cell count, of course, is important when you're doing implantation. You must have a reasonable, basically, cell count. And then we talk about nomograms and how to actually calculate the lens size that actually goes inside the eye. And I'll spend a little bit more time talking about this because I think this is actually really probably the most important part of understanding how to actually basically put the lens inside the eye. If you're going to do the surgery in anybody over the age of 40, okay, and I've actually seen a lot of people now coming, maybe because of COVID, they're not traveling, a lot of people coming to have surgery you must assess the basically their own phagic lens. And, and the reason why this is important is that because of course, if they're having high levels of high order internal aberrations from the lens, you need to basically tackle this by doing lens-based surgery, not by sticking an ICL on top of that itself. So typically I'll use a machine. This is basically taken from MTF function from the uh, to iTracy. We have iTracy or we have basically KL1W. There's just different aberrometers um, to basically allow you to look at, assess the aberrations coming from the corneal surface, coming and also coming from the lens and the total eye aberrations. And I think it's you need to do this mandatory on anyone over the age of 40 if you're going to basically put these lenses in. That's why, obviously, when people are getting older into their 50s, it becomes a little bit easier where you see obvious discoloration of the lens. But I've seen many patients that will have what you consider to be very minimal cataract, but they're getting high levels of light scatter. And the, the way of tackling this problem is not by putting an ICL in, but it's actually doing by cataract surgery for those patients and stuff. So you must assess this beforehand.
AC depth requirement is slightly different between the two lenses. Artisan artifacts about greater than 2.7, of course, it's not such a big issue for AC depth because, of course, it's going in the front of the eye. Uh, ICL is going to be 2.8 for myopia and about three millimeters uh, for high hyperopia. So normally I'll confirm the um, AC depth. We have a lot of patients here um, who have high axial myopia, so they're myopic. They have, but they're mostly axial myopia is actually in the posterior segment, but they have shallow anterior chambers, and these can be very very difficult cases um, to basically manage with this kind of surgery itself. But we we'll generally push the limit to about 2.8, 2.9. Um, and even with the central flow on the V5 uh, C, which is what I currently use, I will still do one PI because it's up, especially if the AC depth is less than three. Uh, angle, basically, uh, measurements are really important, and it's important that you get basically gonio done basically beforehand. If you're not comfortable with that doing a gonio, you can do basically OCT to assess the angle, because you've got to bear in mind, and I'll give you some measurement values uh, later on, that where the ICL is sitting behind the iris in the basically sulco. So you're going to have some push basically going forwards of the ICL if you get the vaulting wrong. And it comes down to basically the vaulting for this procedure to get this absolutely right. So you don't get basically any elevation of the peripheral iris. If you get elevation of the peripheral iris, certainly I've seen patients that were sent to us uh, for emergency opinion where they've induced basically angle closure because the vault has basically been too high. So the inclusion criteria and exclusion criteria, like I said, they can be absolute or they can be basically relative. Most of the patients that we basically will include will be over the age of 21. We don't do any refractive surgery on any patient basically below that age itself. Stable refraction, you've got to bear in mind, these are actually moderate to higher degrees of myopia. Um, amyotropia, of course, not correctable with uh, excitement lens. Unsatisfactory vision. So I put this in a red box because this is not entirely true. Um, I mean, I, I'll show you a case of some of keratoconics as well where I do use ICL, but you have to really pick and choose these kind of cases. Um, good cell count, so basically greater than 2300. No anomaly of the iris or basically uh, pupil, and the mesopic pupil size a bit, bit of less than five to basically six millimeters. Exclude anybody obviously with chronic inflammatory disease. Um, previous intraocular corneal surgery, I, I think this is a sort of um, relative contraindication. I do do it, put it into patients sometimes who've had previous grafts. I mean, nowadays the stigmatism is not so high because we don't do obviously so many PKs now, and, but I do do it in that scenario itself. Obviously, pre existing macular um, pathology. Um, abnormal retinal conditions and active basically systemic inflammatory disease as well. I'm just showing you this more for historical reasons, it, depending on which lenses that you've used uh, currently or in the past. If you used an old V4 lens or you're currently using a V4 lens and you're not using a V5 lens itself, you've got to bear in mind that the lens that you basically take out from your little container is soaked in sodium chloride. So when you put it inside the eye, there's an hydration effect. If you use anything from the V54B series, basically onto the V5C, which is what we basically are currently using now in Singapore, you'll see that the lens size in your container is actually the same as it is basically when it's outside inside the eye itself. And that's because the lens is stored in basically BSS. So you do need to realize that if you do use, the, if you're using the old lens, the V4B, uh, the V4A lens, um, which actually looks very similar to V4B apart from there are a few holes, you have to bear in mind there is a hydration effect when you basically take this out from the, from the little container and you put it basically inside the eye. Other specifics on the lens, this is the uh, Vision uh, V5, uh, C basic lift and lens sizes, you'll see there's a 0.5 millimeter difference in the lens sizes. And this is the range that the lenses will basically go up to from uh, your sphere up to basically minus 18. But you've got to understand this is obviously spherical component at the intraocular plane. So it's not a contact lens plane or basically in the pair of glasses, you need to take off the BVD uh, to work out what the basically power is and subsequently the astigmatism as well to work out what the level that you'll be able to correct at the basically plane of the eye. Some of these lenses that go up to very high sills, like basically uh, six uh, doctors of touristy, you can get them uh, manufactured. And, and I will talk about a little bit when I show you the, the way I implant the lenses as well on what I do basically when I get lenses basically sent to me and then whether you pick and choose or whether to use them or not, or you get the company to basically manufacture. And of course, as you would know, you get a, you get a convex lens basically for hyperopic correction and a plantar concave lens basically for myopic correction as well. And this lens power will go up in 0 0.25 uh, darker steps for a lot of the ranges basically that you need. And generally I aim for basically a little bit of a hyperopic um, post-operative uh, effect uh, for most of the young patients as well. So this is the thing I'm going to really focus a little bit more on and talk about is basically how to calculate the power uh, required for the phacic lens. Because if you get the power and the sizing wrong, basically that's what leads to all the complications. And if you get this right, then basically you're going to save yourself a lot of basically grief when you're doing this surgery as well. 
So anterior chamber fake IORs is quite easy to basically look at the power because they rest in support on the iris. You can use OCT, shine for local basic UBM. Posterior chamber becomes a little bit more controversial. Um, the company basically recommend you use white to white. Uh, you'll see what the results are basically from that, from the FDA trial in a minute. Um, a lot of people basically will use white to white and then they'll basically use something else as well. I use high frequency ultrasound, basically see the positioning of the um, uh, lens specifically in the sulcus. And, and in this paper by uh, Dan Reinstein, uh, he basically showed that actually there's no, or there's very little correlation between white to white to very high frequency ultrasound as well. So as I mentioned, sizing is the main area of source of complications after ICL. Basically, if you if you put a myopic lenses and it's basically uh, generally you're thinking about oversizing it by 0.5, 0.5 to one millimeters from your white to white. And if you put a hyperopic lens, you're putting basically the same or 0.5 over. You have to bear in mind when you're thinking about sizing that the natural crystalline lens is going to basically thicken with age. So of course, as the patient gets older, you're going to get an increase of 18 to 20 microns per year. So what that means is you have to work out if I'm going to put this lens into a 27 year old, how long is that lens going to basically be able to stay in that eye with that vault that I basically want to achieve? And I can, I mean, I, I, I'll tell you what I basically, I tried it. Obviously I'm trying to aim for about 500 microns of a vault and this, I'll show you why that number is basically used by most of us because there's evidence in the literature showing you what's a low vault or basically what's a high vault. Also bear in mind that obviously every time you accommodate, you do move lens position forward by 30 microns. So you've got to bear that in mind when you're basically putting the lens in initially and you make sure you tell your patients that there is some slight, some movement. And initially they may actually notice the lens does actually bulge a little bit and it moves a little bit back and forth when they basically um, have the lens in to start with before the position becomes a little bit more fixed. This is some of the effects of basically poor vaulting. On the left-hand side, you can see this patient over here. This was referred to us that was done in one of the private centers in Singapore. And you can see the ICL vault over here. And this, the arrow is between the ICL and the patient's own lens over here. And you can see the iris basically over here. And the vault is so high here, this pushes patient into angle closure. You can see actually this is a completely flat anterior chamber basically over here. The other side obviously shows the other extreme where you have an extremely low vault basically inside the eye. And actually you can actually see there's already some basic cataract formation uh, on the surface and there's almost complete lens touch uh, on the surface from the ICL on the basically phacic lens itself. So these are the two things you really want to uh, avoid basically seeing uh, in the patients. So the vault itself obviously will be better. And, and one of the determining factors is basically um, by UBM, or whether to UBM are basically um, um, all white to white. Uh, comparative studies, these are done quite some time back with the older lenses, the V3, V4, and like I said, the shape of the lens actually is actually basically very similar. Um, they showed that if you basically have a greater than 90 micron volt over the lens surface, you don't basically get any lens opacity. Okay, the down uh, thing about the study was it was done as a basically single time point, but it shows you an idea. You don't want to basically have a vault of less than 100 microns. So when you follow these patients up longitudinally, when you go down to less than 100, then you're risking basically getting lens opacity. You need to basically counsel the patients that this thing basically happen. The issue with the angle, as I basically mentioned, preoperatively, you should do basically a gonio as well. Uh, what it basically will tell you, or what this study basically showed was, is that to avoid basically angle reduction, you cannot have a vault of greater than 1,000 microns after the surgery. So now you've got two boundaries either side of what your basic vault should be. So the lowest, basically 100, maximum, basically 1,000. If it's greater than 1,000, like I showed you in that, in that OCT picture, you're going to basically cause ang peripheral angle, uh, basically closure, and the patient will get basically angle closure, even if they've got a PI there, because the lens is basically abutting the back of the iris and basically pushing everything further. So those are your boundaries of your area, of your maximum limit and your basically lower limit. And that's where my most of us basically try to aim for about 500 basically microns. If you look at basically uh, fake eye si sizing from studies and you basically look at just measuring white to white, which I can tell you is still what basically STAR basically recommend now itself. And you look at the in, in the literature and then you compare the data of what you consider to be an inadequate vault, okay, or uh, excessive vault, and you just measure white to white, you will see that basically 61% of cases just using white to white Will basically give you an inadequate vault. So basically, too much, too, it was too flat. Okay. In this study, obviously, with less patients, so only 17 patients, it was about basically 6%. And in the FDA trial, 15 to 20% of the cases were what you'd be considered of basically having a poor vault, which I think actually is actually really high. Okay. And I think that's a very high number. And I'd be unhappy with that if our data basically became and showed 15 to 20% had a poor vault. And this is the issue with just using white to white. 
So because of that, a lot of people are using other sort of measurements, using different kinds of UBM. Uh, obviously, UBM has basically improved over, over the time. The issue with low resolution UBM, uh, the show there was a basically a much more, you can get a closer standard deviation with respect to coefficient of variation, more fast field, newer generation, basically probes. There's 50 kilohertz probes, there's 30, 35 kilohertz probes, which is basically what we use. You can see it's basically much, much more accurate, but there is a basically inter-observer vari variator. And, and ideally, you want the same person doing all your UBMs on all your basic ICL patients, which is basically what we have. And that basically will limit your error and limit your basically variation. Something something slightly newer is very high frequency ultrasound. So Dan Reinstein is a very big component of this itself. And he's shown very accurate measurements for intra-exam basically measurements in the, of the sulcus to sulcus measurements. And obviously everybody's looking at the sulcus to sulcus here because that's where your basically lens is going to go itself. So it's important to get very good Intrigue, not only intra examiner reproducibility, but also inter examiner re reproducibility as well. And this is one of the issues. If you have the one technician doing it, you're actually better off having the same technician doing all your ICLs uh, cases because you're going to basically reduce that variation down, as you can see in the results over here. When you look at the coefficient of variation, it's like 0.62 when it's intra examiner, up to 3.4% when it's basically inter examiner uh, variability as well. Uh, newer machines, basically the Sonomed, which is basically by Vishimax, which is uh, uh, ViewMax, which is a high frequency B scan, so it's a 35 millimeter transducer, has shown that the basically inter examiner data is actually much, much more tighter. And also the inter examiner data is also a bit more tighter because it's easier to get that information. Okay, you have to also basically bear in mind that there is a basically variance when you actually measure it. So when you capture the image basically from the machine itself, there's basically two ways of basically doing the measurement. You can take it from the recorded image, or you can then basically extract the image and then actually measure it using basically an ultrasound, okay? And then using calipers. And this will also cause a basically a difference in error. So not only do you want the same technician to basically capture the image, to capture a good quality image, you need to be careful on who's actually doing the measurement. So ideally, what I would say is, is that the person doing the capture should be the same person doing the measurement. And when they're doing the measurements from the extracted image, generally we will use the digital software on the machine, okay? Because that will give you basically the most accurate reading. I wouldn't take it, download it, take it out, stick it into another software, and then basically then do the measurements themselves. Otherwise, you will induce a error. And this is basically what this study showed when they look at two different examiners taking the same image and whether they use digital calipers um, from the machine or they basically took it to an imaging software, they showed a variation based in the results. So this is another error that can basically occur when you're actually doing the variation. So if you look at the data comparing basically high using high frequency ultrasound, and you're looking at here on the left hand side on the vertical chart, you're looking at angle to angle measurements. On the right hand side, you can look at sulcus sulcal measurements. And if you look at the data from over here, what you'll see is the best line, the angle, the line of equipments over here is this dotted line in the middle over here. So if everything was on this line, the two values will match up. But what you can see is that using regression analysis, the best line of fit is basically underneath this. So what it shows you is if you use angle to angle measurements, you're basically getting an overestimation, okay, of the sulcus to sulcus measurements. And some, a lot of people start using angle to angle, um, using higher resolution OCT scans like the Cassia, uh, for example, to basically do the measurements. But generally, you're going to get an overestimation of the measurement compared to actually what is actually happening in reality uh, from your measurement. So if I take a value over here, your line of equipment, say you, in, in the sulcus to sulcus should be 11.5, you're going to basically you actually your angle to angle is basically only going to be 11 millimeters. So there you are going to get a variation. Now, if you compare this to white to white, as I mentioned earlier, there's several studies showing very poor basic correlation. So you can correlation value R squared only 0.35. Your line of equivalence is over here in the basically dotted line and your line or best fit, you can see basically follows on this side as well. So there is some degree of correlation, albeit very, very poor, but you can see that generally the white to white will tend to overcorrect, based, or overestimate what is basically happening in, in the sulcus. And this is very poor correlation. And, and you can imagine that that's why they had 15 to 20% of cases from the FDA study showing that they were outside the area of what would be considered to basically a good fit, which is almost like 80% 80, 80 were good, um, 15 to 20% were basically poor. So from these studies, you can then basically do regression analysis and work out a formula to give you an idea. And that's where you get this idea. I've shown you the extremes. So now you want an idea, what would be ideal, which would be 500 microns. And this, then you can basically work out 
that using these regression formally, you should get 85% of your cases within basically about 500 microns. And then when this is basically assessed prospectively, you can see that about 93% of lenses align between 100 and basically 700 microns. So what would be most of us would be considered to basically be acceptable. 24% um, were basically greater than 500 and 76% were between 100 and basically 500. So you can see you can then basically uh, reduce the effect of your error. And if you look at basically compared to basically the FDA studies themselves, you can basically see that there were 30% that were basically over and 4.3% were basically that were shorter, okay? So you can see you're getting much better data using regression formula than just using standard basically white to white, which is what currently STAR still are actually basically do as well. There have been other nomograms, so this is basically from a paper from Japan, which is slightly more uh, basically detailed, where actually they not only measure the STS, they measure something called STS uh, length, which is basically the length of basically the lens itself above. This is basically the, the serious cell cross as well. And they show by putting this in, the R squared data was basically a lot more accurate. It was actually 0.83. And you can see from over here, with respect to almost 74% of the cases were actually lying between 20, 250 and 750 microns. And, and, and this is really the key, I think, to the basically the lens uh, implantation technique. If you can compare this to the basically the star data and previous studies in the literature, you will see about 88 or 89% of basically using this formula lie basically within the reasonable zone from so 150 up to basically one one uh, thousand basically microns which is way better than the star data which is almost 17.3 percent were too high from basically using a star nomogram and actually pretty reasonable from the doherty nomogram which is about 85 basically 0.2 so what i'm saying is is that i wouldn't just use with a company nomogram because this is the kind of results basically you're going to get which is quite poor i think we almost 16% are basically too low and 20% are basically too high. And you can see this compared to some of the data from the literature. So you need to go a little bit more advanced than what the, basically the company are basically telling you to use. Um, this is something newer that um, Dan's been working on quite a lot. This is using arc, arc scan, using high frequency um, ultrasound. So this is a water bath measurement of the whole anterior segment. So it actually almost looks like a spectral domain um, OCT scan of the whole anterior, uh, anterior segment. But actually it's a water bath um, done using a uh, high resolution, high frequency uh, ultrasound. The patient puts his eye in over here and there's water that basically um, goes across the surface and using the imaging that you get from over here, they devise a very nice uh, nomogram to look at fake IOL sizing and they're doing some prospective studies to look at the accuracy um, of the lenses, uh, of these lenses as well. The other uh, popular um, way of doing this is trying to use the Cassia spectral um, swept source um, OCT scan to look at the angle to angle measurements and then calculate the um, uh, uh, the measurement of your ICL basically from that. So post-operatively, obviously you want to assess basically the patient to look at your angle. So you can use a slit lamp, and I think that, that was mentioned earlier by Murad basically on that paper. And obviously it's actually quite simple. You just basically look at the thickness of the cornea, and then you basically use that as a surrogate marker to basically measure the thickness between your ICL and basically your position on, of your lens. And this study basically showed this was actually quite an efficient way of basically doing it. And it can show that there's some sort of correlation between your subjective vaulting uh, compared to objective vaulting using an anterior segment OCT, which is what I basically uh, do to basically do the measurements. Uh, this is just one of our patients basically. So what we did in this study was, is that we looked at the measurements from intraoperatively in, in the OT uh, using intraoperative OCT. And then we used the same OCT basically postoperatively to see if there's any correlation to give you some sort of idea of your measurements postoperatively, as you can see on the right hand side, compared to what you basically see in intraoperative when your viscoelastic is basically being removed from the eye. And generally it'll allow you to pick up the cases that where the vault may be excessively too high or excessively too low. And because you're in, in the OT at the time, of course, you can basically change the lens or take a lens from outside from the eye. And most of them ended up with pretty good uh, vaults basically um, um, afterwards, and they fell within a reasonable range. So the summary for this bit really is the ICL manufacturer, you have to bear in mind are actually within 0.5 millimeters and the optimal vault actually we want in 0.25 increments. This is one of the issues you, with some of the other lenses that I showed you for the acrylic lenses from India, they do actually go up in 2.5, um, 0.25 millimeter itself. So predictive accuracy is improved with high frequency ultrasound measurements and we use this uh, 35 megahertz UPM. Uh, you've got to be aware of inter-observer variability as well. And obviously it's not 100% with just basically STS. It also depends on the dioptic power of the lens as well. Uh, assessment uh, post-optic, I think is crucial. Uh, you can do it clinically. I mean, obviously if you have OCT, it's slightly better. It gives you an objective basically measurement. And that's what I do basically for long-term follow-up. Long-term follow-up is required um, due to progressive basically vault uh, changes as well. 
So I'm going to start talking about the surgical techniques. So this is one of my patients. I mean, this is an old video using a V4B lens itself. Ideally, you want to obviously patient to be much uh, better dilated. Be much, it's not you have to dilate them basically on table. The main thing is that you're using a um, dispersive viscoelastic. When you put the viscoelastic in, you don't want to inject too much viscoelastic. So you can still see the worms, basically, so to speak, of the viscoelastic threads. And that's how much you want to basically put in. Because remember, this viscoelastic is going to be behind the lens and it's actually much more difficult to get this vasco-elastic out. So you want to still see those worms basically there. Then the incision is basically is a 3.2 uh, millimeter clear corneal incision that's standard for basically most of these ICLs. So the ICL is basically then loaded into the cartridge. When you're loading the lens into the cartridge itself, I would don't pull the lens in. You actually move the cartridge with your right hand. I just hold the lens with the forceps. So you don't actually pull it because you'll see it's actually quite flexible. The key is that when you're injecting, this is not an IOL, right? So oops, this is this is not an IOL. So when you're injecting this inside the eye, you actually just want to inject it actually quite slowly, okay? And what happens is that you'll see that the lens itself has some uh, memory on it. So as it basically goes inside the eye, it will start to want to open. And what you want to do is watch those three dots on the surface and now the end to open up. So inject, wait, inject, wait, inject, wait. So it's not like an IOL, where you just inject it basically all the way inside the eye. And you can use these three dots here to help you show you that when the angle that you're putting the lens is, is correct. Then using this little spatula, you can just basically flip the feet back. So it's sort of grabbing motion and then putting inside the eye. And generally you should avoid going over the optical zone. So this is basically what we call the no fly zone. So avoid basically going over this area. And then I give some basically my stamp and then using a bimanual technique, I'll use basically remove the viscoelastic from the eye. If the pupil comes down like this, then almost for sure, you've got basically most of the viscoelastic, uh, viscoelastic out from behind the lens as well. This is just the torrent case. So very similar implantation, but obviously we just mark it on the surface initially. If you have Kalisto, this can basically help you as well. Um, so again, you inject slowly, wait, inject, wait, inject, wait. Okay, so you just keep on waiting and the lens will just open up by itself. Don't inject it too quick. Whenever I've seen the lenses flip over, it's because the surgeons always injected the lens too fast inside the eye itself. They think it's an IOL and then it's basically sped. So I will really inject it quite slowly and just wait. And as the more and more lens will come out, you'll see the lens will want to open up in its basically natural position. Now you can see the lens is slightly folded basically on the side over here. So I just inject a little bit of viscoelastic on the surface. So injecting the viscoelastic now, it's going to just naturally basically open up. And you can see the basically the holes on the lens over here. And as it basically opens up, you'll basically be in the correct position, okay? So you really want to slow things down at this page because obviously the last thing you want to do is basically put the lens directly basically into the sulcus or actually put the lens too vigorously and it will damage basically the fake lens. So the key points for the implantation is dilate patient well, use the dispersive viscoelastic, but don't put too much in the posterior chamber. That's another big mistake I see a lot of people basically doing. Inject slowly, okay? The lens has some memory and rotate the injector so the lens is coming out in the right position itself so it's in the optimal position so it doesn't flip inside the anterior chamber. Uh, inject the OBD on top of the lens. You don't care how much viscoelastic you put on top of the lens because that's, that's very easy basically to come out and gently basically put the haptics basically into the sulcus. I do use my stat at the end. I know it's a little bit more controversial. Some people basically don't do that, but I do like to get the people down. So I know then all the viscoelastic has basically been removed. And with the central flow and those extra holes now, it actually does come out quite easy. Uh, using uh, the removal of the OBD, I don't like to use a Simco. I prefer using a bimanual technique where I have irrigation uh, coming on one side and then basically I'm just gently tapping on the incisions basically to remove it from the other side. Other techniques that I've seen recently that I don't do, but I have seen, um, uh, there's a, a group in India that published a technique where they just use an AC maintainer so that they don't use any viscoelastic whatsoever. And they just inject it basically straight inside the eye and they supposedly they want to avoid it. And so they, they do this because they don't want to basically get any pressure issues. And last week I was speaking at a symposium in China at this myopia symposium. And in the ICL session, um, there was somebody showed a technique that they were doing in China where they were just injecting it without any viscoelastic at all. So they were actually injecting it directly into the posterior uh, chamber without any viscoelastic. But I mean, I'm probably too uh, cowardice to uh, do something like that. So uh, complications obviously can happen. I mean, obviously, depending on whether what kind of anesthesia you basically give, topical peribulbar GA. Um, we don't do... Um, both cases on the same day. And a lot of our cases we do do under GA or basically regional block. I don't do the cases on the topical, mainly because these are refractive patients if they move and they're obviously you risk of damaging basically the lens. 
Uh, endophthalmitis basically reports in literature vary from about 0.1 to 0.7. There's not that many cases reported, but because of the potential risk of endophthalmitis, there's always a discussion whether you should be doing sequential same day, same sitting surgery versus sequential different day. Um, I, I'll be interested to see what you guys basically think. I mean, what we do is that we do sequential different day surgery. So I do one day, one eye, say on a, on a Friday, and then basically I do the second eye either on a Monday or the Monday and the Friday, basically in between the two days itself. And I tell the patients before I'm pre-op, this is what we do, we're going to do. We don't do bilateral uh, cases, but I know several surgeons who basically do do uh, basically bilateral cases. Uh, complication for angle support lenses, as I basically mentioned, there was uh, quite a few high cell loss rates, issues with quality of glare, surgical induced sig sigmatism, chronic inflammation is an issue, IOP, lens rotation, and of course, um, and then uh, also Uritzvalia basically syndrome as well. So these are all commonly associated with the angle support lenses, and that's why a lot of them were basically withdrawn. With iris fixated, complication rates seem to be less, but you do have this chronic endothelial cell loss. And even though you don't have actually any inflammation, you do get subclinical chronic inflammation. This has been documented by higher levels of flare, and this is caused for movement of the breakdown of the blood aqueous barrier. And that's one of the reasons why you basically get this itself. Uh, you do need to do obviously a PI because the position of the lens up, but of course your risk of cataract is small because it's lying basically in the anterior chamber. This is just a patient that was referred to me uh, who had basically a lens. You can see that the inclination has been done incorrectly over here. So the lens is like dangling down basically in the angle on this side. I think it's done in China. And um, his lens now uh, is lying down um, on, on the side over here. So what we did was, is that I basically open up the incision basically on the side. Initially, I think I thought we we're going to take it out and basically replace it. But then eventually, I think we basically thought I can actually just um, put the lens basically back into position. So I use basically, this is the instrument that they give you to do the enclavation. It's got little hooks on it. Okay. And it's like a little cartwheel. So basically what you do is that once the lens is in position, so you use basically two instruments. So you're getting a sensory hook now to get the lens basically into position. And then basically using that instrument, you put it in through a side port over the area of where the enclavation hole is itself. And actually it's quite simple. You just basically put it in from that side. And then when you put it in over that, oops, let me go back, sorry. Uh, when you go basically back over that area, then you use that little instrument to basically just rotate the iris. And actually, as you rotate the iris near that area, actually, it will automatically go into the uh, opening of the lens itself, the inclination process itself on that area. So you just simply rotate it. And it's the little, the little cogwheels will just pick up the iris and it will basically rotate it into the area of the enclavation. And then you can just test it out by putting on a sensory hook to basically try. And then we just basically switch it up to the incision. This is post-op, so you can see you've got a nice knuckle of virus in the enclavation uh, once you've basically done it with this technique, but it's quite simple to basically do. Uh, posterior chamber uh, lenses, obviously the main issues have been optical quality. With the new lens, the V5C, uh, the optical zone is slightly big, bigger. I did used to notice on the V4s, some of the patients used to notice some ghosting of image and shimmering effect, especially at nighttime in the peripheral of part of the lens. It did actually get better with time, but I did notice a few people actually noticed that itself. Um, you can get basically issues with pigment dispersion or basically lens deposits. Mostly IOP issues seem to be quite early. I haven't seen that many patients with chronic any IOP issues itself. And like I said, initially it can all be related to the vaulting of the eye. You can obviously get pupil block that I showed in that picture. And of course, you need to do basically a PI if you're not using the V5C in people who have AC depths of less than three. We still do one uh, PI, even though we do use the V5C with basically the central flow. The other thing is cataract formation. I'll talk a little bit basically about that, but the rates have really gone down. And uh, the, those are the sort of main things that we basically see with these basically posterior chamber lenses. So with the older lenses versions, the V3, V4, the rates were almost about 8.4%. It was interesting to hear from that paper about the rates of almost about eight to 10% of cataract formation, which seems to fit in quite nicely with what I put on over here itself. With the, v, with the V5C, the rates have actually been very small, but you have to bear in mind, this is quite a new lens. So there's no real long-term follow-up. But the idea or the thinking is that with a new hole in the middle of the, of the ICL, it's actually basically reduced the risk of actually getting um, cataract formation because it's affecting the aqueous basic distribution. Um, uh, Gerald in uh, Austria basically published this paper showing 10-year follow-up in each other's minimal uh, vaulting or, or minimal anterior um, capsular cataracts. If you basically had a vault of basically 230 microns, and as I mentioned earlier, you do have to always bear in mind you're going to lose about 20 microns every year as that patient gets older. So you can then work out, okay, if the post-operative vault is 430, how long is it going to be basically safe for before they're going to go basically sub-90, so you may get 10 years, 
have a flat of 430 volt. If you're basically 730, a micron volt, you can probably get 25 years. So you can roughly work out when you do the surgery, what kind of volting you want. If you're doing somebody in their 20s, you probably want a higher volt. Obviously, if it's somebody in their 30s, or maybe uh, um, then you can get away with maybe uh, less of a uh, volt issue because if they get into their late 50s, or the, sorry, late 40s and 50s and stuff, they may develop some cataract. And of course, anyway, you can take the cataract out at that time. So it gives you some sort of idea to basically to do a prediction. Typically, the cataracts you do get are like this in this picture, where they're basically getting single point cataracts at the point of contact between the ICL and basically the um, fake uh, lens itself. And that's where you get these anterior subcaps of the cataracts. And sometimes, often, they may not actually progress. So I do have patients who are like in their mid 50s now that I put ICL in probably when they were like in their early 40s. And um, they have some of these point focal uh, areas of contact and they're still quite happy with their distance vision and they, those areas haven't basically progressed and I've left the lenses in them for them and then when they will get worse then I'll take the lens out and then put a, 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 a multifocal uh, lens in for them itself instead. So the complications in summary, ACA IOLs obviously have the highest rates of complications, it's fixated less but it's really this chronic subclinical inflammation which leads to endothelial cell loss. Uh, with posterior chamber lenses, cataract is the main thing that you really need to try to avoid. And with the new V5, that seems to basically have been the issue. Uh, people block certainly can be a problem, but nearly any other IOP problems seem to be more of an issue in the earlier, basically, time frame. So I'm just going to finish showing you a few um, cases that are sort of outside the sort of um, indication values. So they go into sort of relative contraindications that you might get started putting in when you get a bit more experience with doing these uh, kind of uh, um, uh, patients. So this is a patient who basically came with a uh, for LASIK assessment. So he has basically keratoconus. Um, his refractive error basically on the right, right side was minus five, minus six cell. Left eye was basically minus five, minus 175. This is basically his rigid acuity. He had an RGP fitting done. So he's pretty good with the with the visual acuity itself, but his wear time is very poor. So what we're saying is functional vision is basically very poor. So he's unable to wear basically for full correction. So the right eye, I did a big bubble dog from the left eye. He underwent cross-linking. So I cross-link all the keratoconics before I'm gonna basically do ICL. So the technique is slightly different. This is just his data basically from the lens that we basically put in. So as opposed to doing clear corneal incision in the cases that are uh, keratoconics, I actually do a limbal incision. And the reason why, if I ever have to go back and do basically a dog there, then I will basically, the, the periphery, the, the incision is actually very peripheral, so I can still do a big bubble surgery. So you can see you've got a little bit of a congenital fleck basically there on the left-hand side in, in the lens. So I go back and do a scleral tunnel. Uh, the rest of the surgery is pretty much the same, so injecting your viscoelastics until you can see the, still see the worms there, enter the anterior chamber with your uh, um, keratome. And then this is a very flat approach, right? When you're putting the lens, the goal is not to get it into the sulcus. The goal is just to get it into the anterior chamber on top of the iris and then gently basically put it back uh, down. And then uh, the goal is not to get it into sulcus first of all. And I've seen a patient who had a lens that was put in directly into sulcus and it opened up so vigorously it basically gave the patient a ciliary body detachment. So that's something that you definitely want to avoid. So this is basically post-op. So this is pre-op on the top left-hand side. This is basically post-op over here. So pretty good volt. He was quite young. I think he was like 20 or 30 years old. Um, so about an 800 micron uh, volt. This is his AC depth is pretty good. And his visual acuity also basically improved on the side. So you can use it in these cases of keratoconics, but you do have to pick and choose your patients who are going to be appropriate. And the key is if they have good, best spectacle visual acuity with glasses, these are going to be the ones that are appropriate for ICL. Um, if you look, you have to always bear in mind when you look at the data and comparing a toric ICL in marks versus a toric ICL in keratoconics, the visual acuity results are always going to be superior in the, in the myopic group because, of course, these patients in, in the keratoconic groups are still going to have higher levels of high water aberration, typical vertical, vertical coma, right? So you're not going to be able to get the same results in your, in your keratoconics as you are in basically your myopic. So that's important to basically bear in mind and counsel the patients beforehand. But if they're intolerant of contact lenses, they may actually accept that itself. But your clue is their visual acuity with the glasses to give you an idea of how well they're going to basically see afterwards. This is another guy. So this, as I said, this was basically a contraindication, but I do do this in, in, in some patients as well. So he had after he had a grass surgery done. So he had a PK done quite some time back. Um, he was also a keratoconic uh, RGP fit. Uh, he could basically get 612, but he was basically poor wear time. Um, his PK was in 2004, but when he came back to clinic, he kept on having regular refractions done um, over that time period. His intraocular pressure was basically stable. Um, and the plan was basically to do ICL from him. So because he had a lot of, um, refractions that I knew basically once he had his sutures taken out on how stable his intraocular, uh, how stable his um, 
uh, refraction basically was. And you can see the astigmatism on the topography map basically um, on this side. So cell count was reasonably healthy. This is the surgery. So again, this is very similar uh, to the previous one that I showed you, um, but now it's obviously in a graft. So you just need to be careful when you're doing the injecting over here with the visualizations. Sometimes the visualization underneath the graft junction can be a little bit tricky because you can't basically see the feet basically going back. Um, you want to try to obviously keep as posterior as possible over here because you do want to maintain the endothelial cells are basically quite reasonable. And then you gently basically put the lens basically back uh, into basically the sulcus. If you do have somebody with a high sill, what I generally tend to do is that I only pick the lenses out that actually have the sill at the zero and basically 180 axis. But you do need to tell the company that that's basically what you want. And that's specifically what I do with the high graph cases. Okay, if the ones that are uh, lower sills, then I don't basically bother. I don't mind rotating it, but I will never rotate a lens more than 10 degrees. Uh, so faking eye wells offer an alternative correction in patients with uh, thin corneas and high myopias, and they have good refractive and clinical results. In lower myopias and thicker corneas, it's a little bit more controversial for use. I do still prefer to use a laser-based excimer treatment as opposed to going for ICLs. Remember, long-term follow-up is required. Obviously, this is different to basically doing LASIK or SMAR because obviously you can discharge these patients. There are a few absolute contraindications to be fair, maybe macular disease, low cell counts, becoming you guys cataracts, uh, patients with pupil damage, and obviously people who are pregnant. Um, it can be used in relative contraindications, as I, certain, as I showed you with certain caveats, but they do offer high quality optical vision and that perspective of reversibility. And the future is really, they have a new lens that's out now for presbarbics to give you presbarbic correction as well. Thank you for your attention. Professor Mehta, really outstanding. Uh, it's a wonderful lecture. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, such a, a complete approach. And well, thank you. <laughs> uh, I will now uh, ask Francisco Bonera if he wants to start this uh, question and answer session. And please, uh, anyone in the audience who wishes to uh, ask any questions or make any comments, please feel free. You can use the chat or you can use also open your mic and video and make the questions by yourself. Uh, so Francisco, please. Well, uh, as usual, Professor Jad, uh, no stones left unturned as expected. Uh, it's, uh, it was a fantastic lecture. Um, first of all, uh, I would like to invite uh, the professors to comment uh, on ICL, their experience. I see Professor Mauro Campos is online and uh, Professor Wallace, I think is still with us. If you wanna comment on ICL, uh, please um, join us. I don't know. Uh, hello. Uh, yes, excellent, excellent lecture. Thank you very much, Dr. Meta. Um, I have one question for you. Considering that the very high frequency ultrasound is very hard to have access to, mm -hmm. which of the UBMs you prefer? You said you use the ViewMax. Uh, yeah. It's still your preference. Yeah, yeah. The ViewMax is very good. I, 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 I mean, we still have that, but I would just say that the, the, the if you have a ViewMax, which I think is actually pretty good. Um, it, you just need to make sure that the person doing the measurements, I would have it, I would limit the number of people to reduce that intra observer variability. And that's exactly what we do. So we only have one person doing all the um, uh, measurements in our refractive patients with your ICL patients. And also in the, uh, actually, he does basically for most of the corneal uh, cases, it's, it's the same person. So I reduce your intra observer variation by having one person. But I think that that's a very good machine to have. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm not sure if Mauro will want to speak, but I would just like to to give our set on it. We tried we tried uh, retrieving our 10 year patients of anterior chamber IOLs, uh, the old ZP 5M. Uh, we weren't able to get like 30 to 40 percent of the patients operated with more than 10 years. But our results weren't close to what have been presented. So uh, the results presented on the ICL were very encouraging. And it's a very nice paper that was presented by Murat. It's not an easy paper to have 60 or 70% of patients after 10 years. Congratulations to the authors. 
and it encouraged us because uh, results were very encouraging. And thank you very much for your effort in being with us here. It's a pleasure and an honor for the Department of Ophthalmology at our school. Thank you very much, Dr. Mayer. Thank you. Thank you. Was. Thank you. Was. Professor, I see uh, some people who have turned on their cameras. Uh, John, um, if I may call you that, I feel a bit intimate. Um, I want to discuss a little bit about uh, refractive surgery limits. Uh, uh, since uh, Cynthia Roberts' paper, a uh, cornea is not a piece of plastic. We all know, we all, all of us refractive surgeons, we do know about that. So there are some certain limits uh, we should respect. And the crystalline not, uh, lens is not like a pimple that you can take it out at, at any moment. So the, the fake IOLs, they come in uh, just in this spot between uh, refractive lens exchange and uh, laser ablation uh, a surgery. But we do have SMILE as an option now. And one of the advantages of the fake IOL is that it, it is reversible. And in theory, SMILE uh, would come in in those patients where you're not certain that you can mess up with the cornea, uh, but you want to have the opportunity to revert the process. Uh, so how do you feel about that? What, what is your uh, personal routine when it comes to defining the, how far can you go in touching the cornea and uh, going for a fake IOL? Where does SMILE fits in, in this yeah. routine and how do you assess ectasia risk, for example? Yeah. So, I mean, I, yeah. So, I mean, that's always a dilemma when you switch basically to doing fake lenses. I mean, if they're very high myope, so over, over 10, uh, easy, then that's a very easy thing to do because of course you're going to basically do, um, a fake lens. That's really the only uh, procedure of choice. Uh, the issue is when you start coming in a bit lower, basically range, I do prefer to do laser based procedures if possible, uh, mainly because even though I know the risks are small, um, like Professor Shimon said, I mean, a lot of patients don't come back, right? And you have to be, even in Singapore, they don't come back. So, I mean, it's like following these patients up long-term. Some people do digitally come, but you know that over time, you're going to lose that micron spaces over there. While you know with the excitement or whatever laser-based procedure you're going to basically do, that's not going to basically be an issue. Um, once you come down into a lower levels, then there are lots of tricks that you can basically do. So if I have somebody who's say minus 950 and the cornea basically allows the thickness, um, I know, you know, we know from publications and we published in this area a lot as well, that if we're doing smile, I can adjust my optical zones basically much better than I can do with LASIK. You don't shrink the optical zones down. So in your higher myopes, they basically do better. They get less regression as basically as we showed in our RCT that was published last year as well. So in those kind of patients, what I will do is, is I'll explain to them, say, look, if you're basically minus 10, the machine will go up to about minus 10 correction, but to get a true minus 10 or minus nine correction, you probably have to program maybe 10, 50 actually to get a full correction. So I'll explain to them, I say, look, this is the way we do it. This is a two-step procedure. I'm going to basically do a smile for you first of all, and I'm going to correct the majority of myopia. I'm going to bring you down to basically minus one. And then what I do is I leave it probably about maybe three to six months. They can go back and wear glasses or contact lens during that time period. And then I will go back and I'll do a surface ablation procedure for them. So I do it as a two-step procedure. And I explain to them, look, this is basically why we're doing it. Because the alternative is basically, of course, we can just basically do ICL. And most of them say, okay, fine, I'll accept that. And I'll basically go down that route. The, the main thing is obviously, how do you assess the biomechanics? And over the last probably three years, we've done a lot more. I, 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 I do a lot. All my patients get Corbis basically done. I do use the TBI a lot. There are some issues with the TBI, especially in different ethnic population groups. But I do think it gives you valuable information in certain cases. And I have many cases showing that basically cases that you would sit on the borderline on in your BAD and your topography is, is completely normal or tomography is completely normal. Uh, the biomechanics is basically abnormal. And then I will basically think again. However, having said that, I can also show you cases where we've repeated the same uh, B, uh, B, uh, TBI score on Corvus in the same patient and it's dramatically basically improved and all I've done is improve the ocular surface. So I don't think as a refractive surgeon that you can sort of live on just reading, just using the instrument, the instruments or analysis to tell you the answer. I do think you have to use your brain as well to basically see the patients in front of you. But I think that you can use the tools to then help you analyze which are the basic procedures itself. But it's very rare I will do LASIK 
I, I, I mean, I hardly ever do LASIK and anyone over about minus five these days for a long, long time since we basically had smile. Anyone over minus five probably will get basically smile as first choice. And then when you drop the values down, then there's obviously a little bit more controversial about smile and LASIK, uh, or LASIK. And then we'll discuss that in a, a little bit more detail with the individual patients. But I think you, these tools are there. And as long as you know the limitations of the tools of TPI and or CBI and basically how they work and what the variations are, then I think that you can understand then what is the best basically option for the patient. Francisco, may I ask you a question? Yeah, of course. <laughs> uh, Professor Mehta, um, you've commented about um, measuring corneal biomechanics. And uh, do you use any kind of um, uh, finite uh, elements, uh, models, or any kind of uh, artificial intelligence in evaluating uh, biomechanics? No. Okay, so I so the main issue with biomechanics in the, in the cornea is that basically the tools that we have are actually not that great. That's the main issue. There's a limitation on the tools. Even, even if you have brilliant microscopy available, um, that it's the, our measurement tools aren't that great because either you have to cause some deformation, as you probably all know with the Corvus ST, you've got to cause deformation with an air pub to then basically look at the rebound effect or the hysteresis to then calculate basically those values themselves, okay? And uh, to be frank, I mean, biomechanics is not a big area of research with us. So, I mean, we, but I think it's something that you really have to, you know, have an understanding of certainly when you're doing it clinically, and because I know that I, I mean, I'm still a, I still believe the fact that smile will give you certainly better biomechanics than LASIK. So I will use that to my advantage when I'm basically thinking about your programming of your lenticles, what size the lenticles are basically, um, as opposed to uh, just thinking, okay, I've, it's going to give me the same basic results as, as, as doing basically LASIK. And if there's anyone I think that is, I think is borderline in that way, that I'll be tendency to do smile. But on the other side, you know, if there's a, if if I really think that it's not safe, then of course I'll either do surface or if it's that really bad, bad, then I won't do anything at all there itself. But I think that you know we don't have the right. I don't think we have a great instrument at all, even with the Corvus SD. I think it's okay, but I don't think it's basically great. And I think that that's the next barrier where more machines will information will come to basically help us evaluate the biomechanics better than we currently have. Um, so uh, a follow-up question on, on SMILE as a, an alternative to fake IOLs and LASIK and PRK is regarding the reversibility. There were some reports, uh, mostly in animal, there are some issues with reimplanting those lenticules. So in the case of reversibility of the procedure, it's something that we need to be aware of. Uh, we know there are a lot of fibroblasts uh, in the stroma that might not react well upon implantation. And uh, how do you see that uh, for uh, the future? In, in the case you have an ectasia, uh, would you consider implanting uh, a, a lenticule in a smile case because there have been reports of ectasia after smile or would you just cross-link uh, uh, this patient? How, how would you uh, manage an ectasia post-smile? Yeah. Or... yeah, so we've only had, so I mean, in in well, we started doing smile in 2011 so we've had we only had one case and luckily it wasn't my case but we had one we've had one case um in 11 years so um and but you're quite right there are cases reported in the literature from there itself um so the the two things are is that implantation is to not biomechanically strengthen the cornea implantation is going to basically give you stromal volume okay so then you can then think about using that to help you with your visual visual rehabilitation there are studies in the literature where that people have done exactly basically that, where what they've done is, is that they put a lenticule back inside the cornea, normally actually a spherical uh, lenticule size, to actually bulk up the cornea and then cross-link the whole cornea with that lenticle implanted. The thinking is, or the idea is, and those most of those cases actually, to be fair, have been LASIK um, ectasias, but the thinking is that if you can bulk out the cornea after the ectasia, not only will you stop the process, but you do have to combine this with cross-linking, but then you could think about maybe altering the refractive power on the surface later on to basically alter the shape. And it's the same principle as, you know, as what we're doing, what we do with some of the keratoconics, where we implant a lenticule inside the cornea in the keratoconic. The idea is you bulk up the corneal surface, you then cross-link the eye, and then you can do topography guided treatment and you know, you, that will give you a better refractive outcome rather than what I 
still hesitant to basically do is where you just cross link and then do surface ablation with PRK or topography guided PRK to basically improve your refractive outcome. But if you bark up the cornea, at least you know you've got more stromal tissue there. So you're going to reduce the risk of getting further progression with ectasia. Perfect. So um, I've been, uh, while I was in Singapore, we're working quite a lot on these uh, customization of lenticules, yeah. cross-linking them. So um, I'd like you to speak a little bit of your uh, tissue engineering projects uh, regarding uh, the subject. Okay. So, I mean, the, you know, lenticular implantation has, you know, been something that we've been looking at for quite some time now, probably from about 2012, 2013. And the initial things were to basically show that you could reverse the procedure or reverse uh, the SMAR procedure that, that was done. And obviously this was done on rabbits and then in monkeys as well. Uh, going forward, then there have been lots of publications in the literature, mainly from India and China, where that's exactly basically what they've done. Now, basically, their groups are working on different things. So we, we do lenticle implantation for presbyopia, where you have a 6.5 millimeter lenticle that's then basically trimmed down to one millimeter or 1.5. So you can change the size of lenticle depending on the size of the patient's pupil. And then we implant that through a pocket that's made with a femtosecond laser. And you've basically got a biological inlay. So those of you who heard of the raindrop implant that's now basically withdrawn from the US market, it works principally in the same manner as raindrop. The difference is this is a biological basically implant. Others are implanting it basically for keratoconus, as I, as I mentioned or people are using it for aphakic cases or hyperopes, where you're putting a myopic lenticle inside the eye. The other area that we do, that we started basically this year to look at is actually to use the lenticule um, as a drug delivery system. And, and this has become available because now, um, certainly in Asia Pacific and Singapore now, there's an eye bank here, there's, there's, a, there's a cord life, which is a, a, a separate institution um, that basically will store the lenticles for the patients um, at minus basically 196. So all our refractive patients now that have lenticular extraction, whether it's smile, clear, or any of the new lenticular extraction procedures, they can actually have the lenticles scored. So when they basically reach into their 40s, they can have it then implanted to them basically use for presbyopic. So once that service now has become available, which got MOH approval last year, they have eye banks there. I think they have 11 banks all across Asia Pacific. So now they're offering this to many other people as well. But going forward, the idea is just to have access to these lenticle tissues to basically use it for also allergenic uses. And of course, it's a fantastic um, ability to actually have all this corner tissue, which we've never had in the past itself, because of course, this would have been vaporized when you, if you've done LASIK. But this is this is currently basically going on now. We, we got approval, I think, in the middle of last year, and our first patients um, had the, len uh, the, the, the lenticle scored in this basically uh, facility. Great. Uh, um, following the tissue engineering uh, subject, I know uh, the focus of this group is uh, surgical optics, but you do have a lot of experience in the lab with uh, endothelial cell culture as well. Uh, and you're currently uh, conducting clinical trials. I think uh, everyone would be interesting, interested to know uh, how, how, how far are we to a clinical application of uh, endothelial cell uh, culture delivery to these uh, fugues dystrophy patients and such. Yeah. So I mean, as you know, I mean, as you know, obviously the um, I mean the trial. I mean the first in man trials were done obviously in, in Japan, um, where the cells are basically just injected inside the eye. And now, of course, this has become become a little bit more of a multi center study. And there are a couple of studies now going on basically in the U.S. as well, and also obviously here. Um, for doing cell injection. I mean, the appeal of cell injection is obviously it's just simplistic compared to doing a DMEC um, graft inside the eye. The main restriction is going to be getting regulatory approval from the different authorities and also then being able to have a GMP facility in that country where you're going to basically be able to culture the cell. So those are some of the things that will need to be basically combated uh, upon because I'm not sure whether it be necessarily feasible for to order cells in like from the United States, say, or from another country. I mean, there is going to be a restriction, obviously, on the viability of cells for that duration. I mean, ideally, if you can be culture the cells, say, for Brazil, for example, if you had a facility in Sao Paulo or maybe in Rio, you could then culture all the cells that you wanted and then distribute it out to the country and then send them out. I mean, that would basically work. But I think that getting it from the United States into, the, into Brazil, I think, will be a little bit more complicated to do that. So I think that it's something that is going to, ha it's going to happen for everybody. And I think we're going to see this uh, in the probably, I would say, 
I would say probably the next five to 10 years, you, you, you are going to see more and more of this itself. And I think this will, this will, this will become available for everyone. We have, have, the problem with this is that it's always with these new technologies, there's always a cost from actually implementing this into a, into a service. And we have to bear in mind that, you know, there are many parts of the world that don't even do EK still, right? So they're still doing PKs for a lot of cases and stuff. And we know that basically from, from the literature as well. So, there are many people who are not even not even reached up to a level of even doing DSEC, forget about doing basically DMEC. And yet now we're telling them, okay, this is the next frontier basically that you guys have got to basically be looking at and stuff. So there is a wide, wide disparity basically when, when, we, when we see this. But I think that a lot of centers, I think, will go into this much, much more, um, it, probably than I would say in the next five to 10 years. I mean, after that, I mean, gene therapy, I think is still a little bit far away because convincing patients to have gene therapy for foods is a little bit more challenging because obviously these patients who are, are normal and they can see well, and then you're asking them to inject a vector inside the anterior chamber or take a oligonucleotide by an eye drop for a long time, like talking about 25 years or something like that. So that's going to be a little bit more challenging. And so and I'm not sure really the big utility, to be frank, of using a uh, gene therapy approach for Fuchs and so especially if we can culture enough cells and that might just basically be the answer to basically just go down that route and avoid basically doing gene therapy completely. Perfect, Professor Jad. Uh, I think I could spend the whole night uh, talking uh, and, and updating uh, uh, with you, but uh, I'd like to, to know if there is anyone else to, that would want to ask you a question um, and open to the to our, our, uh, our audience uh, so they can participate. Uh, Filippi, do you have uh, any questions you'd like to ask Professor Jad? Uh, Professor Mauro, uh, he, he's on the plane. I don't know if he can uh, talk. Uh, should... Filippi, probably I, I, I can talk very fast. Thank you. Thank you, Jad, for being with Thanks, us man. here. Thank uh, you. I, I, I'd like to just mention two things. First, in Brazil, we don't see high myopes very often. Uh, in population-based studies we performed in the last three years, uh, high myopia retinal changes were observed in less than 0.5% of our yeah. population. So it's a completely different scenario than you see in Singapore and mm -hmm. other Asian Asian studies. Uh, I, I just uh, think it's a little funny to see that stable uh, refraction on high myopes, we don't see it. And it seems that nobody sees it in the entire world, even in pseudo fake high myopes. They still grow the eyes. Sorry. Sorry, they still grow the eye, even though they have no more lens inside the eyes, only the, mm. the uh, 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 let's say, the IOLs that we place it in. So we, we, we don't see stable refraction on high myopes. But my question to you is two things. First, the, the, what the hole in the lens has changed in anterior chamber inflammation. Does it really disturb less the flow of the acus in the eye? First question. Second question is, do you see any hole on rock inhibitors for clinical use? Sure, okay. Yeah, so I'll, 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 I'll tell you the flow on the lens. So the th theoretic, so initially when they, when they went to the holes, the holes were initially on the, they were initially on the, on the haptics and then they went to this center flow hole. Um, there are a few patients that you will get some dysphoptic phenomena from the hole basically being there itself. Um, I think that most of the thinking with the hole and changing the aqueous dynamics is more theoretical than practical. There are no studies, as far as, far as I know, where the people have done aqueous taps and then look at inflammatory markers with the V4, V5C versus, say, the V4B, which checks this change in aqueous dynamics. But the thinking is, is that, by by alt having a having a hole there, you're basically affecting the basically the flow rates, uh, changing the flow itself. People have looked in the past at just having actually a PI there alone, and that can basically affect the aqueous um, dynamics and the way the aqueous will circulate. So I think that that's that's the, it's more of a thinking or a theory. And the other thing is that the, by having a hole there and having the aqueous coming out through that central area, 
The other thinking is, is that you get better nutrition to the anterior lens capsule, so it will reduce the rate of anterior subcapsular pacification. So that's the other thinking by having that basically central flow there as well. So one is flow, one is basically nutrition to basically the anterior uh, lens surface. Um, with respect to the rock inhibitor, yeah, so I, 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 I do. I, I think that you know techniques such as um, DSO or decimal strippings only um, with the use of rock inhibitor, I think can be quite useful. I mean, you do have to be very selective on your patients that you basically uh, choose uh, for the surgery. Um, it, certainly not everybody. Um, I mean, there's a lady, I can tell you the last case I just did, so I did a case this morning, um, uh, this afternoon on a, a young lady and she has um, a regenerative therapy approach in one eye where I just took off the decimase and she's had rock inhibitor treatment on one side. And on the other side, now she had that, I think about four years ago. And on the other side now, she had basically had a decomposition, but her area of gutte was much larger. So I left, she had, so I did a fake DMEC for her this afternoon. So even in the same patients, you may actually have to basically do two different surgical procedures. Um, patient selection is important. Ideally, you want the patients with high density corneal guttata in the central area. Um, there are patients that you will see that will have this sort of, um, uh, haze uh, around basically the death thickening in the decimase membrane and where there's endothelial cell loss around that area as well. These are the really ideal patients to consider basically doing DSO with rock inhibitors. And I think the role of rock inhibitors there is the fact they're going to basically increase the speed of the cell migration, also basically cell proliferation. The other things that are undergoing trials, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm on one of the boards of a company in the US that's undergoing um, phase two trial now which is using a um, injection of um, intracameral um, basic uh, basic FGF. And that's undergoing trials in the United States. I mean, I've seen some of the data, it's not published, but I've seen some of the data from some of the early phase one studies and that actually, that looks actually very interesting. And it's the same principle. You'd basically remove the central guitar and then you'd give an intracameral dosing of uh, basic FGF. And currently at the moment now, um, the phase two studies that are undergoing in the US are looking at different basically dose response curves um, and looking at what's the different ideal dosing and there's different um, strategies that we're doing. So I don't think it will just be rock inhibitors alone. There'll be other medications or drops that basically will be able to be used um, in this manner, but the concept will still be uh, cellular regeneration of the patient's own cells. But you have to always bear in mind with all of these techniques in Fuchs, that genetically the cells are a high chance of being abnormal, right? Because if they have um, uh, repeat sequences in the cells, these are not normal endothelial cells. So long-term, of course, you would expect these cells to probably get guitarta again, and basically the cells, may, the cornea may start to decompensate. But what you've done is, is probably delay the time the person may have to have surgery. Perfect. Uh, thank you. Is Mauro with us? Yes, Mauro, Mauro is still with us. Regard, uh, regarding the rock inhibitor subject, I feel in, uh, obliged to comment. A lot of people are prescribing the drops for a few patients without uh, any signs of this, this decompensation early and moderate yeah. few. Uh, is that uh, happening uh, in other places in Singapore? Uh, what's your take on this? No. So as you, as you know, I mean, it's not going to work. It's not going to do anything. I mean, it may lower the IOP a little bit, but I mean, um, it's not going to have any effect there because you haven't got any um, loss of basically contact inhibition. So I think this pointless basically um, giving it um, uh, pre -op, giving it like in that situation. Um, I, I can't see how it's going to basically do anything at all, uh, giving it in that situation. Okay. Any other comments? I have a, a question. It may sound like a cheap uh, future teller question, but uh, Professor Amata, uh, you're a distinguished uh, professor in clinical innovation as well. And I'd like to ask you, if, uh, for our um, young researchers, and if I had to focus on uh, something uh, to, in ophthalmology, I mean, uh, what would be, which is, the most promising, or where would you spend uh, the most of your time uh, looking for uh, solutions, or uh, what do you think there will be? A, there's going to be a great breakthrough in in the next few years. What uh, what mm -hmm. are your uh, expectations? Yeah. Um, 
career advising here, Jod. That's that's a question. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think that I mean, so the first thing is is that you know you got to do something that you're interested in, right? So the whole driving, I mean, the whole of our lab thing. Francesco spent a year there with us here. He will see that the whole of the lab, my lab focus or research focus, is to drive innovation on the clinical side. So the two things as a clinician, you have the advantage of seeing patients. And then you have the advantage of being able to take that to the lab and then basically bring the whole thing together. I think that you should always bear in mind, or I think that you should always think that if you are doing the same thing that your parents are doing or if you, or and the generation above you are doing, then you've done nothing. You, you've done nothing to make your patients better. You know, anyone can sit there and do like hundred something cataracts and stuff, right? But my dad could do the same thing, right? But the point is, is that, you've got to think about seeing where our field is basically going and how can you make it better? Every patient that you will see, I see, you see in clinics, they'll be sitting there and you think, okay, shit, can we do something here to improve the outcome? Can we basically make something better? Now I've seen obviously a massive revolution in corneal transplantation going from when I was a fellow, when we were doing PKs, just starting uh, DLEC and then basically DSEC and then basically obviously much more into DOC and now obviously to DMEC and now basically into cell therapy. So that's an that's in a space of almost like 10 to 12 years, right? So if you can be part of that revolution and that's the driving factor to make you think, okay, we want to basically do something. Likewise, now, if you look at the other big areas, obviously, as you mentioned, AI is a very hot area. We have a lot of massive research stuff going in AI and, and stuff, not necessarily specifically to biomechanics, but even nomogram production, even imaging, AI imaging for basically looking at corneal nerves and using it a lot of in, in our work, basically in our corneal work as well. So AI is a huge area that's going to basically affect everyone in all basically fields. Forget about medicine. I mean, even outside basically medicine as well, right? So it's going to affect every single basically area. But when, you know, it, it, as Francisco will tell you, it's, it's very easy to be happy doing research when all your papers are accepted, you get tons of money and all you, and everything is going okay. But the majority of times it's not like that. The majority of times is your papers won't get accepted. You have to basically review them, you have to read them, you have to write the papers down. You have to basically get money for your grants and then you're gonna to have to go and do your clinical work. That's the time where you really gotta think, okay, do I really enjoy this? And am I, am I gonna spend time and effort to basically do this? And I would just tell anyone who basically, if you do it, do it because you enjoy it. You don't do... You know, I don't, you know, I'm lucky in the fact that obviously, obviously I've won a lot of prizes and things over the years and we've had pretty good grant funding, but that's not the reason for doing the, the, the work, right? The publications and everything is great. And I think we do that because of an educational standpoint, but I don't sit there and think, okay, I've got to publish 40 papers this year. I don't think like that. I, I, we do it because we happen to just basically publish a lot of stuff because I, we hope that other people are going to read it and say, okay, fine, someone's done this. We can think about what they're doing. And then we can have a thing, but we actually, I mean, there is actually quite a lot of enjoyment and some of the really big things, like I think I just saw some of our Peter's children where they had regenerative therapy, where we gave those girls the sight back and they were two year old girls, right? Or five year old girl was the first one who basically we did this regenerative therapy approach for her. And she went from basically 2960 to, to, to 612, basically, or 20, uh, 2040 vision. And now she's like 69 uh, uh, vision in that eye itself from a non-transplant technique right? In a, in a young girl. So those are the things that you think, okay, wow, this is actually pretty cool. You know, uh, this is like, this is, this is actually quite interesting. So I choose something interesting. There are lots of areas I think that are basically up and coming. And obviously I'll be biased and say cell and gene therapy, but I think AI is obviously a massive big area across the field of ophthalmology as well. But cell and gene therapy is also basically a big area as well, but I would do something that you enjoy, you enjoy reading because it, that's when things are going a little bit more tougher and you don't have time and you're tired and things as well. That's the time when you want to really see that where do you need to really have your enthusiasm to keep going and stuff. And that's where a lot of people will then flake off basically. And, and because they don't basically have the enthusiasm because they're not interested to, to doing it or they're not interested basically to really pushing it through. Thank you very, right. very much, Professor. Uh, Francisco and um, Professor Meta, I would ask for final remarks. And as Francisco said, we could spend all night here, but uh, we had to go. Uh, so, <laughs> so um, I see Professor Richard is uh, with his camera on. Uh, does he want? To, do you want to uh, share something with us, Professor Ida? It's okay. <laughs> so, Jod, once more, thank you for your kind. Uh, kindness to um, share uh, your time with us, especially uh, that we took advantage 
of it uh, in several uh, uh, areas. Uh, I think little uh, or almost no one here uh, knew you before this, this lecture. And uh, I think my uh, perspective on going to Singapore was kind of uh, to break the uh, um, to break the the status quo. Most of researchers and clinicians in Brazil they go to the U.S. Mm-hmm. and uh, I felt that I, I could overcome this uh, uh, this distance, and I couldn't be more proud and more uh, uh, grateful for the experience that I had in Seri and SNEC. And I'd like to thank you for the opportunity and also to invite uh, all of the young researchers and uh, the, these young fellows uh, to know about uh, Singapore. The, the, the work Professor Jod is doing there and previous work for, for others and from others in, in SNEC is amazing. It's uh, a whole uh, a bench uh, from the bench side to the clinics uh, work approach is very translational. So you don't get stuck in the lab, you can see uh, things coming true. So um, this is my final remark. Uh, and if you have any questions, you can always reach out to me. Thank you, Professor. Great. Thank you, Francesco. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for the kind invitation uh, to partake in the symposium. It's, it's great. Um, I've always enjoyed the time when we go to Brazil um, from being there for like two years back. And hopefully uh, we'll be able to travel again soon uh, sometime. Uh, but thanks very much for the invitation. I'm very honored to be to be able to give this lecture. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you. Well, for our audience, uh, have a nice day. And Professor Meta, have a nice uh, weekend and a good night. And well, we'll see. Um, we'll see you again next week. Uh, please keep tuned and have a nice weekend. A nice week, everyone. Bye bye. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.